All right, today we're going to start learning about bonding. The first thing we're going to do is separate ionic bonds into uh, covalent bonds. So our two types of bonds that we're going to introduce today are ionic and covalent bonds. Remember that ionic bonds are between a metal and a nonmetal. Covalent bonds are between two nonmetals. So first, let's describe what's going on in ionic bonding. In ionic bond, electrons are lost and gained in the, resulting in the formation of ions in ionic compounds. So remember our metals are losers, our nonmetals are gainers. So this bond is gonna form because fluorine really wants an extra electron and potassium would like to give its electron away. So metals tend to lose electrons to form cations. Nonmetals tend to gain electrons to form anions. So here's how it's gonna happen. If a metal wants to lose an electron, it's gotta have a nonmetal around to take it. Once potassium loses its one valence electron, it no longer has 19 electrons, it has 18 electrons. It's like argon, so it's happy, but it still has 19 protons. So potassium is a charge of plus one because it has 19 positive protons and 18 negative electrons. When you add up plus 19 and minus 18, you get plus one. Now let's go to fluorine. Fluorine has seven valence electrons. It loved to get eight to be like that noble gas. So fluorine has nine electrons total, seven of them are valence electrons. When he gains an electron, he will have 10 electrons and he'll be like neon. So when he has 10 electrons, which are negatively charged and nine protons, which are positively charged, he'll end up with an overall charge of minus one. So the compound of potassium fluoride actually consists of positive potassium plus one ions and fluoride minus one ions. They're held together by the electrostatic attraction between the positive ion and the negative ion. So that's what an ionic bond is. An ionic bond is the attraction between the positive and the negative cation and anion. So what are covalent bonds? Covalent bonds are different. Now, atoms still want to achieve a noble gas configuration. They still want that octet. But because it's between two nonmetals and nonmetals are more electronegative, instead of losing or gaining electrons, they will share an electron pair. This shared electron pair is called a bonding pair. Now, today we're going to simply go over nonpolar covalent bonds, and tomorrow we will introduce polar covalent bonds. So an example is Cl2. There's two chlorines in there, but they both have the same electronegativity value. So the difference in electronegativity between these chlorines is zero. Now each chlorine has seven valence electrons. They want to get to that eight. They can't steal electrons away from each other because they're both highly electronegative. So instead of taking electrons from each other, they will have to share. So in order to achieve an octet, they will share their lone electron, like such. See how this chlorine has an octet now? This chlorine has an octet now. And in the middle, they have a pair that they are sharing, the octet. Octet is achieved by each atom sharing the electron pair in the middle. This is called the bonding pair. So each chlorine has one bonding pair and three lone pairs. Three lone pairs are on the outside there. Lone pairs are pairs of electrons that are not shared. This is called a single bond. One bond consists of a pair of electrons, so one bond consists of two electrons. This is called a single bond. We abbreviate single bonds with a dash. So this is the chlorine molecule. Let's try this again with oxygen. 
So oxygen is also a diatomic element, meaning that oxygen never comes by itself as O. It always comes as O2. Now this is the electron dot diagram for oxygen. Remember I told you that we were going to place those P electrons around the atom, one on each side before we double up? And this is the reason I did this, so that you can identify that oxygen has two non-bonded electrons. It has two single electrons that are not in a pair, so two unpaired electrons. Now, they're going to form a bonding pair with both electrons. So they will share two pairs of electrons this time. And this is how this octet is achieved by each atom. So each oxygen has two lone pairs and two bonding pairs, and they will achieve their octet this way by sharing two electrons with the other oxygen. Both of them are the same. These are two bonding pairs here. This is called a double bond. A double bond is when you share two pairs or four electrons. A double bond consists of four shared electrons. We'll represent that with uh, two dashes. That kind of looks like an equal sign. So this indicates that there are two shared pairs and there's four electrons that are represented in those two lines. And that's how we would draw the oxygen molecule. So the key is that almost everybody on the periodic table, the elements, wants to achieve an octet. So you might say to yourself, well, the periodic table, the elements, just filled with metals. So most of my compounds must be ionic. But the reality is ionic compounds are very small, so they aren't going to form as many compounds as covalently bonded compounds. Because when you have a covalently bonded compound, an example is carbon. Carbon has four valence electrons. He'll form four bonds most of the time. And this just allows for a wide variety of possibilities for bonds. And they can be these huge molecules too. So they can be small molecules like water and carbon dioxide. Those are covalent compounds with only nonmetals in them. This is alcohol or ethanol. All of the alcoholic beverages that exist that you would drink, not you guys, you're too young, but anybody else would drink, the active ingredient is ethanol in each and every one of them. None of the other alcohols are ingestible. This is aspirin. So this was, aspirin was one of the beginning of them studying compounds in the lab and trying to reproduce natural compounds in the lab. So um, they recognized that a lot of people have for a long time used things around them as painkillers. In this case, it happened to be tree bark, like people used to chew on tree bark as a painkiller. So some smart scientists said to themselves, I want to isolate and figure out what compound is it in this tree bark that is in a pain reliever. In this case, it was salicylic acid. So aspirin, the active ingredient in aspirin is salicylic acid. It has 21 atoms. So they took this natural compound, they took it to the lab, they reverse engineered it, and they produced it in the lab, and now you can go to the store and buy as much aspirin as you want. Here's sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone. 40,000 different proteins you have in your body, including insulin, which is a large molecule, hemoglobin, which is a huge molecule. There are about 10 to the 40 possible combinations containing up to 50 atoms. We've only found less than 1% of those. So let me give you an example. Um, when I was younger, they were synthesizing something called ibuprofen. Have you guys heard of ibuprofen? Do you remember what the first brand name of ibuprofen was? Island. 
That's acetaminophen, but it's about the same time they were doing Tylenol and acetaminophen too. Um, acetaminophen actually came earlier, but like um, Advil was the first ibuprofen. So ibuprofen is the name of the compound and Advil is the brand name. So what happens is, is then they come up with this compound and they get it approved by the FDA. They have 10 years to make money off of that particular chemical formula. It is a trade secret up until that point. And then um, after that, anybody can use that compound. Now, Advil still makes ibuprofen and still makes money off of it. But you know you can go to the store and buy generic ibuprofen. There's also other brand names like Motrin. And that came after that 10 years came up. So just try and stop and think for a second. How much aspirin or acetaminophen or ibuprofen have they sold all of those are compounds that people synthesized and then went on to make large amount of money with them so the reality is there's a lot of possibilities if you wanted to get into scientific research there's a lot of possibilities for compounds to find the cure for cancer is out there the cure for alzheimer's is out there and it likely comes in this combination of organic compounds that we were just talking about, which would be covalent compounds.